today we're going to be looking at F1 wings, in particular the F1 rear wing and how it works and why they've chosen some of the design features that they have done on such a wing. Now I will be producing another video on the front wing, these are only going to be pretty short videos but I figure this will be nice bite-sized pieces for you to chew off. Just starting by staring at the wing in particular, there's a few things to notice. The first one is, is that an F1 wing is a multi-element wing. There's two main pieces on it and the other things to notice are is that it's got end plates, these nice big end plates, and finally it's got a lot of slots and stuff in the end plates that you'll see on a lot of them. And I'm just going to break down these three main things and explain what they are as well as do a brief explanation of the DRS system and how that works. To start off with, why are they multiple element wings? If you've watched my video on vortex generators, and at this point you probably should have, you'll know that flow separation is caused on surfaces when they exceed a critical adverse pressure gradient. Now, if we consider a wing, we can see that as this tilts up and approaches stall, this is going to start separating off the back. So you're going to end up with flow separation here, and that's going to get ripped off until there's massive level stall and all of that is ripped off once this is at a big enough angle. Now we can delay this separation by energizing the boundary layer, again discussed in the vortex generation video. And basically any method we use for that will allow us to push the wing further without it stalling. Now of course if you put vortex generators here it will do that. But where's there an area of high energy flow? Well on the top, it's getting pressurized by the oncoming flow, right? So what about if we were to just bleed off a little bit of air off the top and bring it through to the back? So we'll just do a little bit of a pass through here. And we can see now that that's going to energize this boundary layer here. And from that, the flow will be more attached, okay? But that's not a great profile. You've got sharp edges, it's going to be sensitive, not generally good for flow. So. Instead, let's round off the edges a little bit. So we'll just round that off, round that off, and we're now getting something that's more like a multi-element wing, but now let's try and just extract a little bit more from it. So we'll use that extra energy off the high area to act as if we're starting a new wing at a new angle of attack out from scratch. So we'll put a second element like that. And now we can see that this is a multi-element wing. And this is why multi-element wings exist, because you can take that high energy flow off here and then use it to keep the flow attached on there. And this is why at low angles of attack, you do not need a multi-element wing. You only need it when you're trying to push it much harder. A key thing to note there that I didn't mention is, is that you can have more than just two elements. You can have three, four, five. I saw a paper where they used eight. And the thing is, the more elements you have, the more total downforce you're going to get. But the problem is, is that more elements induces more drag. You've got all this, all these channels will take energy out of the air because it's being forced through there. So keep in mind, multi-element wings aren't necessarily more efficient. Otherwise you'd be seeing them all the time on big aircraft instead of just as slotted flaps that they deploy on landing. Anyway, using this multi-element system, we can see that there's an easy way to reduce drag here. Currently, this whole system here is acting like a fully attached wing that is shaped like that, right? It's got the same sort of camber line like an actual wing, okay? That's the camber line on the wing. That's the camber line on the multi-element. And this is going to produce a lot of induced drag. Now, when I'm talking induced drag, I'm talking vortices off the end. And I'm going to come to end plates and talk about that later. Basically, though, what you need to know for now is that the more lift you're producing, the more drag you're going to inherently get from the wing. Not to mention there's other sources of drag, but let's just go with the lift induced drag now because that is very high. Now we can see that if we were to back off this camber line a bit, okay, flatten it out to there so that we end up with a wing shaped more like that, we can see that that's going to produce less lift than that inherently. And that's basically what the DRS system is kind of doing. What it does is it takes this wing here and it turns it so that it's flat like that. And with this gap 
with the gap between those wings now open and this wing at a flat angle of attack, we can see that instead of the flow getting kicked up like that, it's going to be running a lot flatter. And with that flatness, you're going to drop your induced drag dramatically. Now the key thing to note here is that you're also going to drop your lift dramatically or your downforce. And this is why a lot of teams have had a bit of problem with flap angles and DRS closure rates at the end of straights. And you have to really balance it off because if you snap this open and close really fast, the flow doesn't have time to attach. So if you snap it closed as fast as possible when you hit the end of the straight, your driver may not have full downforce when they're hitting the brakes. So this is just why sometimes you need to close that slower than you perhaps like, just so you can get that attached. Or you may have to close it earlier, which is a more common thing. So things like that are all things that you have to consider in the DRS of the rear wing. Of course, some of you may remember the F-duct, which was the, I guess you could say, the precursor of DRS. And this was basically a rules workaround by some teams to have the driver activating the uh, aerodynamic DRS of the rear wing, if you will. They had a duct, the driver could press their knee against it, block it off, and that would then cause the airflow to go through to this rear wing, blow through here, and then stall it. And even though that would increase the drag produced by stalling the wing, the resultant reduction in the induced drag was then sufficient for it to be a net improvement in drag. And the thing is, is that this is still kind of done in a way, because now instead of using the driver to press it, what they can do instead is use the horns around the air intake. And the pressure from here will obviously vary with speed, because this is just coming in at a certain speed, increasing the pressure. Now once this gets high enough, you can have this so that you have some sort of aerodynamic valving system. So not a mechanical valve, an aerodynamic valve. And eventually once it reaches the right level, it will then basically stall the rear wing. You can do that. And the advantage of this obviously is, is that it, this allows you to effectively DRS above a certain speed, which is useful because you're not allowed to DRS everywhere on the circuit. So this basically works around that and is a pretty cool way of doing it. Let's now look at why reducing the lift results in a reduction of drag inherently. Let's say I have a wing here, sitting here. Now on a wing, the aspect ratio is defined as the ratio of the cord length, which is that, to the span, which is that. Now cars and race cars in particular have low aspect ratio wings. The rear wing on an F1 car is very, very low aspect ratio, as you can probably see straight up. And the lower aspect ratio wing you have, the less efficient it is aerodynamically. That's why aircraft have massively long wings and gliders have hugely long wings for their cord. And the reason this is, is it's all to do about vortices. If we look at this wing, flow is coming along here. This wing, we're trying to get downforce. Okay, now what does downforce equal? It equals a high pressure region on the top and then a low pressure region on the bottom. So we have a wing here, this high pressure, that low pressure. Now, of course, that means that if we now look at it in 3D, this high pressure is trying to force down and the low pressure is trying to suck, right? It's naturally going to cause a suction. And the problem here is, is that the properties in a fluid such as air are transferred around, okay? so this can effectively see what's happening on the underside. And because this is high pressure, this is going to try and migrate around to the low pressure, which is basically a vacuum, okay? So you end up with a bunch of it trying to flow that way. Now, obviously there's such a high component here that it's not just going to stop dead and turn around. So instead you end up with, and it loops around that way, okay? Now, with it looping around that way repeatedly, it's producing a vortex, okay? By definition, there's a swirl. So you end up with a vortex coming off the back here. And vortices are lossy. You have to use energy to produce a vortex. And the result of this is, is that all this pressure along here will not be as high as in the center, right? Because this pressure is being used and it's a gradient to get the vortex around. And the same thing on the bottom side. On the underside, it's not gonna be as low as you like of edges. So, how do you get around this? You want to stop the pressure spilling from the top to the bottom. So what we do is we block it. We put a nice big fat end plate on there. And with that end plate there, 
it's much harder for the vortices to form. You'll still get vortices off the top and the bottom of the end plate, but the important thing is, is that you're not going to get such a massive vortex as if there was no end plate at all. And this is the reason why end plates exist. On an F1 car, of course, the end plates are very large. They go to the bottom and they also double as a mount in addition to usually a center support or similar like that. And because it's running to the bottom, we get quite good end plate efficiencies. But of course, we have to not always think in terms of what's going to give us our most downforce. We need to sometimes think of what's happening in drag too. And if you have just a solid end plate, this vortex can be actually quite powerful. Your end vortex can be powerful and your drag downforce will result in a really high induced drag. Induced drag being the drag produced by the vortex, which going back a bit is the reason why our DRS works. Now, imagine if you could just bleed off this vortex a little bit softer. So instead of forming one massive vortex at the top, it was forming a bunch of smaller ones, lower energy ones, and it was just a much smoother transition. You wouldn't lose too much downforce, but you would gain a lot back in efficiency. Well, such a thing is possible. You put a bunch of slots that are angled to just allow the air to go the way you want it to. So the slots aren't just cut, they're angled profiles, and this allows you to bleed off this air, this high pressure air better, and the angles make sure it's still going up. So you're still getting good downforce, but you no longer have this massive vortex. So your efficiency is much better. And that's the reason why the slots are on the rear wing. Looking at the slots on the bottom now, because you see a few of them with slots down here. They, I'm not 100% sure on this. I haven't studied these extensively, but from my understanding, they are angled out. So they're deflecting flow outwards. Now this is dual purpose. One, it is going to inherently resist this vortex up here from forming, but by the same token, they're quite a far way down. So it's not going to be huge and they're not running at big angles. So that's not going to be huge. But two, the diffuser, which is trying to expand laterally down here is helped out by these veins, well, essentially veins that will help it expand laterally and keep the flow attached within the diffuser. Like I say, I'm not too up on these particular slots, but I believe that is their function. So that's how F1 rear wings work. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.